Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Murphy. I'm Director of History and Policy at the Institute of Historical Research. Um, and this special History and Policy online seminar is going to be looking at digital history and government record keeping. Um, and we're, we're going to look at the, sort of the challenges for future generations of historians uh, posed by born digital materials and the storing and arrangement and access to those materials. And um, perhaps also, you know, some of, some of the advantages that digital technologies provide to historians um, in terms of things like tailored searches um, and, and making, making materials more, more widely accessible than, than purely physically in, in archives. Um, but clearly lots of problems, not just for historians, but also for government itself, potentially, around things like freedom of information, security, and data protection. Um, so we have a, a really expert panel to, uh, to discuss these points. I'm going to ask the panellists to make some introductory remarks for, for five or ten minutes. Uh, we'll then have um, a, a discussion amongst the, the panel, and then we will take questions from from the floor and i know there's a huge amount of experience not just on our panel but 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 in the audience as well so please um use the the chat function uh to pose questions um as as they occur to you um and my colleague jacob ford will feed those in uh towards the end of the of the panel panel discussion um, so let, let me, uh, and just the, the, you know, the usual uh, online protocols, please uh, mute yourselves if you're not, if you're not speaking, uh, and we will be recording uh, this session, um, because I think there's so much, there's so much interest in this, in this topic. So our panel, um, delighted to introduce Alex Allen, who is a member of the Oxford Internet Institute and who served as the first UK government e-envoy. Uh, his previous roles included Principal Private Secretary to the Prime Minister, and High Commissioner uh, for Australia. Uh, he, was also sub, uh, he was also Permanent Secretary of the Department of Constitutional Affairs and the Ministry of Justice, and is a former chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee and Head of Intelligence Assessment for the Cabinet Office. Uh, with him on the panel are my colleague, uh, Professor Jane Winters, who is Professor of Digital Humanities and Director of Digital Humanities Research Hub at uh, the School of Advanced Study. Uh, her research focuses on digital history, born digital archives and digital cultural heritage, and she's currently working on a range of projects with partners, including the UK Ireland Digital Humanities Association, and Heritage Connector. Uh, with on the panel uh, is Jason uh, Weber, who is the Web Archive Engagement Manager at the British Library and UK Web Archive. Uh, Jason has worked in the Web Archiving team at the British Library since 2014. Uh, with him is Tom Stora, who is head of web archiving at the National Archives. Tom has been involved in a number of projects uh, for uh, the National Archives, in particular, the UK government web, web archive, as well as social media archiving, uh, network analysis and digital preservation. And finally, we're delighted to have with us um, Professor Ulrich Tidal, uh, who is Professor of European History and a Digital Humanist currently based at UCL, where he is Associate Director of UCL's Centre for Digital Humanities. Ulrich is also co-convener of the Low Countries History Research Seminar at the Institute of Historical Research and Principal Editor of Dutch Crossing Journal of Low Countries Studies. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask Sir Alex Allen uh, to make some introductory remarks, Sir Alex. Sorry, just trying to find the yeah. unmute. Um, 
I, I mean, I'm I'm here. I think not primarily because of the uh, my career that um, Philip outlined, um, but more because I wrote a report in 2015 uh, looking at. Um, <clears throat> digital uh, government handling of digital information, which followed an earlier review I'd done on uh, other aspects of uh, um, government information, primarily paper-based. And um, so I then continued and did one on digital information. And I, I don't regard myself as an expert on these issues, but I did find that the review I did was fascinating and threw up quite a lot of issues. Um, and I suppose the primary thing that emerged from uh, my review was that the guidelines on what to do and how to deal with digital information were ad perfectly adequate and um, indeed, you know, if followed completely, would have produced um, very satisfactory results. The problem was in the implementation and the fact that uh, the requirements on individuals were simply not being followed. There wasn't the high level oversight. There wasn't the uh, attachment to the importance of uh, maintaining digital records. And I don't have huge insights on um, how things have developed since then, but my sense is that, you know, some of those issues still remain. Um, and um, a number of sort of more specific points. One of the things that I uh, noted was that the US had this policy of designating certain senior officials and keeping their an entire archive of all their emails. Now that runs slightly counter to our policies of uh, selecting what the um, in my review that uh, actually, in some ways, I think it would be useful to do that for senior officials, ministers, private offices, um, partly because the costs of storage are, is coming down hugely. The tools for searching are improving all the time and will continue to improve so that actually having a larger volume of material, some of which may be completely irrelevant, um, you know, in some ways won't matter so much because search tools will enable um, people to filter out the uh, um, work. I mean, I must just add to one anecdote of, I did some work overseeing an exercise in um, uh, SIS um, about um, looking at uh, detainees and things like that. And, um, and their system was extremely primitive and you could only search for single words. And of course that produced um, a huge mass of un, um, un, I mean, irrelevant material. Like if you search for fear, you get a huge number of um, uh, things like, I fear I may miss your deadline for this. But the one that amused me most was um, that a search for rendition, which you'd have thought would be pretty specific, turned up at least one where it said the American ambassador gave a wonderful rendition of White Christmas at the party. So, um, I mean, th those in those days, search tools were very primitive, and certainly for um, what, what that organization had. Search tools are getting better all the time. And I, I, you know, I, my instincts are to preserve more rather than less. And of course, one of the issues that's um, emerging is use of WhatsApp, use of Signal, Telegra Telegram, and all those sorts of um, uh, services. Where I mean, we saw, for example, in the recent case where um, the advisor on ministers' interests was uh, now sadly departed, was looking at uh, the issues around the decoration of the prime minister's flat. And he did an investigation and was told that the cabinet office had no relevant WhatsApp messages. And it wasn't until the Electoral Commission did a separate review of that and turned up the WhatsApp messages. And I mean, again, while the guidelines are clear about what, you know, that what's significant information on WhatsApp should be transferred over to official records, it's just not clear that's being followed. And um, and equally, there are issues about uh, people, ministers using uh, private uh, phones and, and you know, having conversations that are uh, about government business and are not um, transferred. And I mean, the Institute for Government did an interesting report recently on the use of WhatsApp, and I think it's 
recommendations are very telling. So I, I think I'll, I'll pause there and um, let the others who are much more expert than me um, speak. Thank, thank you very much indeed. And I mean, I posted a link in the chat to Sir Alex Allen's uh, 2015 report. Uh, it's, it, it makes fascinating reading. You can see that um, subsequent reviews of, of this issue, which seem to bring out the same problems, frequently refer back to it. Um, so uh, Jane, could, would you like to go next? Great, thank you, Philip. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am just going to share three slides with you. And I am going to start off uh, with an example of what happens when you don't look after your digital data properly. Uh, this is a party political example rather than a, a government record, but I think the principles are the same. Uh, and this one attracted a lot of attention. Some of you may remember it. Um, to my knowledge, the first time that web archives found their way into the mainstream media in the, in the UK, and that's in the news pages rather than the technology pages, uh, was November 2013, when it was reported that the Conservative Party had deleted more than a decade's worth of speeches from its website. The story was given an added news angle because one of those speeches was by the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, praising the internet for, quote, making more information available to more people. And that didn't really square with the fact, that, as you can see here, the speeches they'd rather we forget. A Conservative Party deletes archive, Conservatives erase internet history, and so on. It was noted in The Guardian that, again, quote, in a remarkable step, the party has also blocked access to the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, a US-based library that captures web pages for future generations, using a software robot that directs search engines not to access the pages. Uh, that isn't quite right in terms of the details of this case, but it's interesting that need to explain what the Internet Archive was in quite such detail indicates the novelty of this idea that you could preserve the web in this way. Uh, on this occasion, of course, the British Library was able to say that it had been archiving the Conservative Party website since 2004. So the material had been preserved as part of the National Historical Record. Uh, and that the role of organisations like the British Library and the National Archives, as you're going to hear in preserving this material, is incredibly important. Um, the archive of speeches was uh, open access was um, restored at the Wayback Machine, but it's still very, very difficult to find and to track down. This is the um, first page of the speech archive and that particular David Cameron speech, there is one capture in the Wayback Machine that I've been able to find. So uh, that feels like um, happenstance rather than a planned preservation policy. We're lucky that this has ended up here and been kept. But it also wasn't the disaster that was first presented. Um, so this is very scarce. This is a unique record in the Wayback Machine now. And there's a, a, another copy which will be slightly different held by the British Library because of the, the vagaries of web archiving. But the flip side of this scarcity and ephemerality is overabundance and variety. And uh, some examples of this. A, a, a review, a business intelligence review conducted by the National Archives, which is um, actually complementary to Sir Alex's uh, wonderful report, was published in February 2016, uh, The Digital Landscape in Government. And uh, it focused on the different kinds of material that, that were coming up in this review. Electronic document and records management systems figured a lot. Uh, but there were some rather alarming figures even then, and bearing in mind that this is um, six years ago now. Oh, sorry. One department had an email server that contained half a billion emails. Numbers given by government departments ranged up to 190 terabytes held in email servers, and that will have increased enormously since then. A questionnaire that was circulated in 2012 to 13 indicated that 42% of government departments surveyed had automatic email deletion policies. Only 30% of those departments archived their emails. So we're losing quite a lot of material. And thinking more broadly beyond those kind of documents and emails to social media and web archiving, uh, a nice quote here, only 10% of government departments reported that they were actively capturing social media content, 
or that they required staff to ensure that outputs government created on social media were captured. 30% had a medium level of capture and 60% were not capturing social media at all, although some were looking at developing policies, uh, even though social media had been around for quite a while at that point. So um, it's, a, it's a very patchy, difficult situation, different degrees of understanding, different degrees of enforcement. Again, this is something that Sir Alex brought out so well in his report. Uh, and it's fantastic that we have two speakers from bodies that are making sure that some of these gaps are filled and that we do have a stable record of government and its digital outputs. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. Um, that leads nicely into uh, the uh, opening remarks by uh, Jason Weber from the British Library. Hello, everybody. I'm going to just share a couple of things as well, if that's OK. Um, so th thanks for inviting me. It's, it's, it's really uh, fantastic to be here. So um, I work for the British Library and the UK Web Archive. Just, just quickly, the UK Web Archive is a partnership of all six UK legal deposit libraries, and we try to capture the whole of the UK web space, or as much of it as we as we can. So this is all publicly published digital material, usually websites, but can include some other things as well. So this won't be some of those things that, that were mentioned, like emails and WhatsApp groups and those kind of things. This is mostly was this entirely pub publicly uh, published material. However, this, this does include um, lots of government websites. So we do the main government website, such as the Government of Wales, uh, Government UK, of course. Um, we also capture quite a number of local authority governments, if that's something that's also important to you. Um, and we take snapshots in time of, of, of a website and, and as we take lots of copies you can you can see how a website or a web page has changed over time so just to give you a very quick illustration of that um the gov.scot have, have made a fantastic job over the period of the coronavirus to um give out guidance and then they link directly to the web archive when they when they change it so these these pages are um are updated so this is this is a page that was given out as guidance way back in may 2020 uh, very early in the um lockdown period and we we've captured many this, this this particular page we've captured many times and the and the kind of the latest page looks looks a little bit like this and just to compare it guidance here was as such and if we look more recently it talks about pcr tests and lateral flow tests and we can kind of um any any research or anybody who wants to see how this advice changed historians looking at it in the future um you, you can get a picture through through looking at different versions of the same uh, website um so this is what we mainly do we mainly cap, cap, capture websites and and give access to copies of them uh, 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 some some like these will be publicly available but a lot of what we um capture can only be viewed in in reading rooms um of UK legal deposit libraries. Uh, the, the other thing that I, I would like to mention is, is, is a project called Do Document Harvester, which is where we uh, try and capture official papers um, that have, uh, have been published digitally. So these, these are often things that were published um, uh, in paper form, uh, and, and, and more recently, they're only often uh, published digitally. And these are, these are curated, and they, those are available uh, through the main British Library search. So you'd go to the Explore the BL. I've got an example here of a government document, um, which you can see a nice PDF of. So that's another thing that, that uh, uses web archiving technology to try and find official papers. Uh, just do a very quick mention to a project, um, if you like a graph. Um, this is called the Shine Project. It's webarchive.org.uk forward slash shine and if you look under trends you can you can look at um the popularity of given words and um I, I, jane didn't mention so I'll, I'll do so we we one of her students and uh Kaya Mello and one of my placement students sarah abdullahi is doing a, 
a lesson through uh, programming historians on using web archives and specifically the UK web archives uh, data. Um, and that'll be coming out shortly. So if you're interested in, in, a, in a way of using this, some of this data, uh, look out for that. Um, I'll be tweeting about it. That's a very quick overview of what, of what we do. I'm sure we'll get into much more stuff. And, and uh, normally, if anyone is looking at government uh, websites, I'd normally point them to the UK government web archive and I'll segue into introducing Tom. Thanks very much, Jason. Tom, over to you. Great, thanks for um, thanks, Jason, for that for that introduction. Yeah, so um, yeah, Tom Storer, I'm head of web archiving at the National Archives. Um, so I will just talk through some of the sort of context in which we operate and um, what our collection what our collection is. Um, so we are, um, you know, as the National Archives, we're the official archive of of, of UK government, um, and uh, we operate um, under the Public Records Act. Um, and some other some other legislation too. The Public Records Act is a format neutral um, piece of legislation, um, and my team are um, concerned primarily with, well, exclusively actually with with web archiving and social media archiving of government departments, and and uh, arms length bodies and 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 so on. Um, so we take um, we take archives of traditional websites. We also have a a large and ever-growing social media archive. Um, all of the content that we archive is public domain. So uh, we we sort of our remit stops at the point where um, a user would need to would need to log in or, or access it, you know, across the, the wider internet if you like. Um, so um, Basically, so just some statistics from our collection. So we've got about um, we made about forty thousand archives of about ten thousand websites over t over twenty five years. Um, it adds up to about six and a half billion digital resources, um, or two hundred eighty thousand terabytes of data. Um, and we we obviously we stepped up our efforts in a great deal over the last couple of years in response to the pandemic, but also in response to some of the major changes. That have occurred um, in the state around Brexit, um, and um, our our archive is um, is publicly available, um, so users are able to to access the content via our our website. Um, in some cases, via Google and other search engines, and we provide a full text a full text search service, and so on as well. Um, we. We have a we have a sort of a different model really to to most of the to the way in which most of my colleagues operate at the National Archives in that um, we 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 have a we have a sort of pool a pool model of 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 archiving content into into the web archive and what I mean by that is that we proactively go out and identify government websites and published government material. And pull it and pull that into our archive rather than waiting for government departments to identify content to to transfer to us, if that makes sense, which I which would be you know more of a push model, which is a traditional way uh, that's been previously mentioned. Um, so we we perform a lot of a lot of quality assurance on our on our collection and our kind of real um, yeah our priority is to make sure that for our relatively small corner of the web um, that we capture it as well and and as completely and as comprehensively as possible um, so we've been doing a lot of work as well so our, our focus has very much been on capture um, in these times um, and we are moving towards a, a, a doing some more work around access so our, we're really interested in understanding what researchers what historians would like to you know would like to know what services we can stand up to help them there are a number of things that we've already done and really help us in that effort our our web archive is in is in a cloud computing environment which is really helpful in terms of sort of processing it and providing um uh extracts of that data and and all sorts of other services um I think one of the big sort of themes for my for my team and 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 
for our sort of strategic direction really is about how how we best engage with our our users and collaborate with historians um, in order to to serve the needs of of people asking questions of our collection that's it thank you thank you very much indeed tom and uh Uli, if you'd like to uh, go next Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, I have very little to add. I also have no um, slides to share, but maybe I can speak a bit from a user perspective or as a historian basically trying to access uh, these sources. I think one of the fundamental issues is that there are these kind of permanently changing platforms and formats. And, <laughs> and I'm saying this as a 19th and 20th century historian. So like the, the type of sources and the way as a historian you deal with them, changes of course with every with every um media innovation that comes about so in in in, in previous centuries you see like richly annotated uh, several drafts the diplomatic document with corrections and marginalia which of course gets much less the moment telephone arrives basically and and we don't have any call of that so we've got something similar uh, going on now of course with email and and social media and 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 other forms of uh, um, other forms of media um, I'm, I'm saying this as somebody who himself has uh, used to work in libraries in a previous uh, job. And I just remember like about two decades or 20 years ago, um, national libraries, legal deposit libraries, like spent lots of effort on preserving CD-ROMs that came with books in the back. <laughs> if you remember, uh, I, I was mar just marginally involved with that. And it's just something that has been overtaken so much by, by the web archives and, and, and rightly so, uh, as we've heard from previous speakers. I don't even know where I'm heading with this. It's, it's just um, uh, a memory that came back uh, to my mind. Um, what's interesting also, I think, is um, um, the probably not just as a historian, but there are also quite interesting potential government applications. I just recently kind of came across the, you know, the Freedom of Information Archive uh, at Columbia University, which kind of does all sorts of innovative uh, analysis of information that's been gained by freedom of information requests. So especially from the State Department, I think UK cabinet uh, um, data is also in there. And I think one of the applications or one of the projects they are having at the moment is kind of to try to develop algorithms that predict or that, that use, for example, topic modeling or similar uh, um, AI uh, 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 data mining technologies, basically to predict which topics have been classified and which can be declassified. One of the problems being the huge explosion of information and of documents being made available and like just using the normal the regular declassification processes will never be able to cope with the amount of uh, um, diplomatic material that's produced nowadays um just a few random thoughts maybe i should leave it at that for uh, for the moment just because jane mentioned uh, the internet archive um uh, and the wayback machine i think i think we saw quite a number of interesting cases uh, about that. What, what comes to mind, didn't a former advisor to the prime minister also claim to have predicted the corona pandemic uh, uh, and changed his blog? And it's something which was so easily be uh, um, un unwieldy by, 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 by uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and can I, can I just remind everyone in the audience um, to pose questions, comments, on chat, um, and in a few minutes, we'll we'll feed these to the expert panel. Uh, I I really I, I wanted to to start the discussion really by asking a question of my own. Really, as a as on on the on behalf of all those sort of historical dinosaurs out there who are used to doing archival work on paper files, which we're used to and we like, and and I think the reason we like them is. Um, they often produce the unexpected, and they're you know they're generated in real time. Um, a paper document is is generated, it's put in a file, then the next document is put in the file, and the file is preserved. And and what I mean by the unexpected, let me give you give you an example. Um, there was a very uh, a very well known Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in New Zealand in 1995 
which is, is pretty pivotal. I mean, it establishes the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, which is the way in which the Commonwealth polices its, its values. So I ordered a file on that when it was released a couple of years ago, a very thick file, expecting to see the genesis of the, the Ministerial Action Group. It was not. Let me tell you what it was about. John Major, the Prime Minister, was very worried that he was going to be out of the UK in New Zealand on Remembrance Sunday. He was terrified by the optics of that. And he became even more terrified when he learned rather late in the day from the palace that the Queen planned to go over to New Zealand for the opening ceremony and then hop back to London to be at the Cenotaph for Remembrance Sunday and he wouldn't be there. And, and, and the, the vast majority of the correspondence in this file is, is about precisely that. Um, and actually it tells you, so, I, I think that if civil servants had been asked to preserve particular documents, you would have had the, a sort of narrative shaped by the wisdom of hindsight as you do in memoirs. Um, and they would have preserved stuff on C, the few documents that existed on CMAC. Uh, rather than what there actually was there. But actually what there is there tells you far more about the British attitude to the Commonwealth um, in relation to domestic politics than, than a, a kind of selected um, uh, and curated uh, collection uh, generated in, in hindsight. So what, what are, his, are historians of the future gonna have access to those sorts of records for the sort of 2000s, 2010s, which, which will actually tell us how policymakers viewed problems at the time. Um, and so if I could go to Sir Alex first on, on that. Um, yeah, well, I was there at that Commonwealth Heads of Government oui. meeting and I well <laughs> remember all the issues over um, the Remembrance Sunday. And in fact, we ended up um, having a, I don't know if this was in the file, we ended up organising a, a dawn service at this little church yeah. on the yeah. top of the hill with mist in the valley, <laughs> Nelson Mandela and some of the other heads of government were there and it was actually one of the most moving um, uh, events we had and it was, it was filmed and broadcast back in the UK to demonstrate that John Major wasn't um, ignoring uh, uh, Remembrance Sunday. Um, and Yes, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, I'm I'm not that surprised. There wasn't a huge amount about the genesis of, of Commonwealth decisions, partly because, I mean, that they weren't necessarily originated by the British government. I mean, the British government would have um, commented and participated. It was mostly Commonwealth. I don't know to what extent there are Commonwealth records uh, covering that. Um, I mean, they, I'm sure, would have much more about the. Um, actual business of, of the meetings. Um, I, I suppose the point I was really making was, was would, you, would you nowadays be, be able to get together, you know, put together uh, a collection of documents generated in real time that would tell you in the same way um, how, you know, how, the, how the, the Downing Street Prime Minister's office approached a particular issue? in terms of piecing together the various bits of electronic data that might have been generated? I mean, there's certainly, you know, I mean, taking that instance had, I mean, there probably were quite a lot of emails in those days, but um, I mean, now the whole thing would presumably have been done by emails to and from um, London and, um, and you know, th they, would have pr they would provide a, a just as full a record as, uh, of, of that particular issue as you found in the paper files. I mean, it's a question of, you know, would they be preserved and um, what, you know, what formats, how you'd actually be able to search them. They wouldn't be obviously in a tidy paper file, but um, I, I mean, the material would all be there, um, assuming it was preserved and transferred to the National Archive. Um, to Tom, from the point of view of the National Archive, um, how how effective do you think the sort of preservation and and 
uh, sort of archiving indexing of those sorts of things, like the huge quantity of emails actually is? Well, I mean, it's not my it is not my um, my exact area of special mm. of, of speciality. However, yeah. um, I mean, within the within the the, the sort of the the, uh, the role of the National Archives um, to sort of assist and support government departments with looking after their digital information and then you know um, supporting them in in making selection decisions for future transfer and so on. Um, I think it. I, I think it's um, you know it's it, the model that we operate under is 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 very much a sort of selection based as was as was said previously. Um, so if a you know if this content were to have been selected for permanent preservation, then um, at such and such a time it would be would would then be transferred to the national archives. Um, I mean we've we've recently. We just we've just transitioned to a twenty year rule from a from the thirty year rule. So now, mm. now the twenty you know uh, twenty years is a lot is you know significantly less than the thirty, and we're right into that early two thousands period where um, content is now being received into our digital into our digital archive. Um, so I think a lot of it a lot of it would the the coverage and the quality and the completeness of the resulting archive will be down to those. Those selection decisions that are made by the by the creating creating bodies is, is that is that move towards the twenty year rule putting extra pressure on vetting teams that 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 are already having to kind of deal with new issues around born digital technologies? Um, I think I think so. I think there are some implications. There are certainly some implications around uh, FOI. And so on that that come up. Um, the the transition though has been very very sort of staggered. It's been very it's been you know over over several years. Um, so that that has been quite you know quite well smoothed out over that time. But um, undoubtedly the, the 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 challenges of digital are mm. you know go right across um, all teams really. Lee, were you waiting to come in? Uh, not at the moment. Later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jane, we. Um, yes, I, I, I can come in. Um, yeah. I think it's still going to be possible to make those serendipitous discoveries okay. uh, to find a digital file, and, and it takes you off down a, a, yeah. an avenue that you weren't expecting. Um, and that's that's always been quite difficult to well difficult to do deliberately. It's serendipitous. You happen. You weren't expecting it, and but that was what you got. But I do think questions of access are going to, I think the reliance on keyword searching that we have at the moment um, makes it very hard. You can only search for what you know is there, really. You can't search for what's missing, for absence, for things that you don't know mm -hmm. about. And um, that really takes research in a particular direction. It's, it's easy to find evidence for things that you know about already, but it's much harder to to do that really exploratory i don't quite know what's in this archive so how do i go mm. about getting a sense of its scope and its range so i think questions around access um are challenging there uh, there are some fantastic tools being developed there's a, a wonderful resource for dealing with emails that was developed by stanford libraries called epad and that's starting to you know, work through problems of duplicated information in email threads. You know, what is the core piece of information here that I'm interested in? I don't need all the extraneous material around it. Alternatively, I might be interested in who all the people who were copied into this rather than necessarily in the details of the email itself. Ruth, um, Ruth, is, Ruth is asking about faceted searches. Yeah. Yeah, can, but when you've got billions of results, faceted search also only gets you so far, you might narrow it down to 200,000 rather than 2 million results, I think is where the problem is starting to happen with the web archiving um, already at scale. And just getting that sense of what's in the archive is, is quite challenging, but faceted search definitely helps. Mm. Um, and something else that I, I don't know if this is happening, but the potential to um, collect document histories if you're preserving all the versions 
um, cabinet office, I think, uses Google Docs and you can track all of the changes and who added what. So are we getting that? You could get a really rich picture of what's going on um, if that happens. And just final thing, Philip, you mentioned historians are our kind of happy place. It's the archive and uh, we know what to do and we understand archives. And one of the great things for me about working with this information has been a re-engagement with archives and archivists because I don't have enough knowledge to do this on my own. I need to talk to people like Tom and Jason and understand how the archive has been created, what that means, what I can and can't access, um, what the technology has done, um, how it's interacted with the content and so on. And those conversations have been enormously profitable. And I think it's a really nice kind of digital archival turn for historians that you, you can come back and really engage with archives again, even though they're digital ones. Jason, would you yeah, to come in? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, the uh, so the, the the kind of scenario that you you, you particularly outlined, um, as in what you know, what, did, what was John Major thinking of, of that thing? I think we're unlikely to get through um, a public facing archive like the like the UK Web Archive. We only get what the final message is because of what, what someone has put on their website. So we're unlikely to get those in, insider comments. Th those are the things I imagine will come out after twenty five years in, in the National Archives. Um, but it's it's interesting the example you give. My my, my student, um, my PhD student, is, is is doing research on on the remembrance period and and how um, uh, officials treat it and how the people treat it. And one of the interesting things to note from his research was that the uh, how the media talk about remembrance and how uh, ordinary people talk about remembrance is is often not the same message and. One of the things that he found was looking in a web archive, which is a lot more of a democratized uh, way of publishing. Anyone can publish a blog on their thoughts on on the the re, you know the, the latest armistice uh, celebrations, and he found that that gave a wholly different picture uh, alongside the official message. So one of the, the lessons I, I would say, if, if you're studying that kind of thing, is is that the the wider web archive can give you a a different context, a much more democratic mm. context, alongside perhaps the official government line or what um, major news outlets might be doing. And do do I mean? Is there any sense that with the the rise of of digital technologies, politicians are operating more and thinking out loud more in the public domain? I mean, one thinks about Donald Trump. You know, you would one doesn't need to wait twenty years for, to see what. Donald Trump was thinking on on any particular day. You know, he told us on he told us on Twitter. Um, is that is that going to change the way that we write political histories? Do you think? Uh, yes, but it's a very very. It is an interesting context, and we do um, capture um, uh, tw Twitter streams, particularly around elections and things like that. We mm -hmm. often get um, politicians' Twitter streams around those those times in particular, and, mm -hmm. it, and it is very interesting. But I think the other. The other side of that is is and Jane hinted at this is that there's a lot more to look at um there won't be just the odd snippet in a couple of papers these will be quotes on numerous websites numerous uh, social media outlets mm. um and, and many other ones that we don't capture like the, the amount of YouTube and things like that that are going to be widespread and there'll be lots of it but are not being officially captured okay thank you Uli, yes right. I think the type of research changes. So it's indeed much more difficult to make those serendipitous finds. Like mm. some of my favorite finds actually I got when when actually I was accidentally delivered the wrong box. <laughs> and then there was <laughs> yes. a really interesting, we should maybe build in some some error uh, margin or so into our algorithms or so that this mm. occasionally happens. I'm just joking. Um, but that's probably less well replicable in, uh, in the digital world. But on the other hand, we've got all these macro queries, the, the, the big data type of uh, inquiries that we can kind of uh, make in the material and, and uh, the web archive, of course, being a primary example for that. Or I'm thinking of all the visualizations. If you see visualization of, I don't know, the US diplomatic cables, like from, from the past 30, you can see the shift from Europe to East Asia and, and, this, and this type of, this type of um, research, which is a different type of research, which can go hand in hand, yeah. of course, with with the with the micro level with the interpretation of individual documents and series of documents thank you um i mean so, so alex one of the interesting things that, that comes out of your report is the idea that 
me that, that public inquiries can provide a sort of snapshot of some of the difficulties that future historians will have in, in accessing relevant information. And also I would assume freedom of information requests, whereas in the past it would be possible to say, well, do we have a file on this or him or her? Um, it, now it surely it must be more difficult for government to recover all of the relevant information it has um, in relation to a particular request or indeed a broader public inquiry. Um, what are your feelings about that? Well, uh, I mean, one of the things that was clear and actually came out in my report was that um, public inquiries are, are a powerful tool for ensuring that all the relevant material is preserved, gathered together and released to inquiries because inquiries quite properly want actually to have as much information as what they can. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's quite noticeable um, that when a public inquiry, you know, when is one set up and, you know, an instruction can be issued to government departments to preserve, collate and bring everything together. So you do get a, a hugely rich uh, uh, series of, of material uh, for that. I mean, freedom of information, I mean, in, in some ways, it, um, it, it, it makes a lot of the uh, material, should make a lot of material available before um, 20 years. Um, but in practice, of course, it's much harder. And um, I think all the issues about um, um, government uh, resisting publishing stuff um, are well known and I mean I'm afraid I've been a witness <laughs> for the government on a couple of occasions uh, arguing why something shouldn't be released um, but um, you know in principle um, freedom of information is a very powerful tool for accessing material. Thank you very much indeed. Does anyone like to anyone else like to come in on that on that point? I suppose uh, I suppose I could just mention. Um, yeah, I think that that um, you know AI AI um, approaches um, in general can can certainly assist can certainly assist sort of uh, human um, evaluation of documents for for release in that sort of context in the context of FOI or or even initial publication um, through transparency. Um, but fundamentally, we are still at the point where, you know, those decisions need to be made by, a, by an individual, by a human being, because, because of the level of complexity, the context of documents, the, um, the various attributes and so on that they may, that they may have. Um, so um, yeah, AI, I kind of think through all of this, AI is a useful tool, but it's not the kind of silver bullet. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, the, just, a, just a further point before I go on to, to take some of the, the questions from, from the floor. And again, it's going to make me sound like a terrible Luddite, but it, it, again, a sort of defense of paper that, you know, paper was the, the medium of record for, for centuries. And one, one knows that it will, it will be there and it will be accessible. And, and I think it was just really following up on what something one of the panelists said about, you know, preserving CD ROMs, which are now are now sort of pretty much obsolete. It, it reminded me of a seminar at the Foreign Office a few years ago, on the back of the the revelation of the Hanslet Park archives that had been sort of hidden hidden away, uh, archives relating to various colonial governments. And, and following the declassification of those, it was revealed as a sort of headline figure that hundreds of thousands of documents remained uh, unreleased. And the Foreign Office line on that was that a lot of these are just things like CD-ROMs, disk drives, things that are just sort of no longer easily accessible with modern technologies. And I wonder what sort of thought has been given to that sort of great imponderable of what, what sort of electronic storage methods will in a way survive the, the changing fashions um, and technological developments, which will mean that they will still be 
preserved and still be easily accessible? I mean, Jane, do you want to? Um, yeah, I can, although I suspect that um, yeah, there are yeah. people on the panel with more expertise yeah, than yeah. me. But I think that in general, it's a conversation about um, emulation versus migration. So um, is it the data that you want, regardless of, of the medium in which it's stored, and then that will allow you to migrate it and keep it accessible in a recognised standard form? And in terms of emulation, that might be I want to be able to see this particular government website in something that replicates the browser experience at the time, or I need to be able to have the CD-ROM menu and navigation available to see how that worked and how people interacted with it. And mm -hmm. um, they're both tricky. Um, emulation is much more bespoke than, than migration, and they, they've all got challenges, but people it, working in places like the British Library and the National Archives are really thinking very hard about this um, use of um, PDFA as an archival standard for textual material, regardless of the format in which it's come in, for example. Um, and I think most of the, the, the larger national bodies will have a room somewhere that's full of a uh, kit that people will recognize <laughs> from the 70s, 80s and 90s on which things can be replayed in a safe way that doesn't, um, doesn't cause an action to happen like updating the date last accessed on a digital file you have to have it protected so that you're keeping that metadata as well so it's not it's not easy but um it is possible but it it ties back into i think the point that we um so alex mentioned at the start about a willingness to implement the proper records management that makes sure that you have it in the first place in mm. order to be able to migrate or emulate and make available Tom, you were nodding at that. Would you like to come in and then ask Jason? Yes, I, I'm, I think that's really important. Um, I mean, knowing, you know, no departments knowing what they have is one of the, you know, is one of the fundamental first steps in digital preservation. Um, and there are various tools that that can help departments with that. Um, so sort of profiling tools, which will go through their systems and tell them what they have, the kind of formats they have, and can identify um formats that are at risk so um if um you know if a if a if a if a file is transferred at such a point that there is no software that can actually read that file then then um there is a high risk that that will actually be um be a, a use you know useless archive if you like or will at least be very expensive to um to to open at a future date um there's also a, a i think kind of encouraging sort of early transfers is also a really important um, aspect to this. So um, the sooner that, you know, the National Archives can be, you know, in custody of, of material, the sooner we can ourselves um, make sense of the of, of that digital collection and apply measures to, to, to preserve it and give access to it. And there's a, there's a service that's been in development for some time called TDR at the National Archives. I can post a link to it in the, in the chat, which is um, a service where it's a browser-based service where departments can upload content through a web browser, and it will it get trans it gets transferred directly into our digital preservation system. Um, so we're at that, at this point, it's just for open records, and it's on quite a limited scale. But that's the sort of direction of travel that we're moving in. Thanks very much, and Jason. Yeah, and then I'll bring Julie in. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jane is a big, a big room in the British Library that has loads of old computers in it. Uh, she's right, there is one. Uh, my colleague Nicola has put a link in the chat to Flashback Project. Do have a look, it's pretty amazing. So that, that does exist, uh, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, I'm, I'm going from memory here, so, so the, the numbers will, will be approximate, but my colleague Andy Jackson some time ago did a, a test on, our, on the web archive and found something like 600 plus proprietary plugin type technologies of which, and I think this is a massive guess, I think we, we were able to, you know, play back 20, 20, 40 of those. It's just that a very small number of technologies, you know, HTML, you know, be the main one, um, does the vast majority of websites. Um, so, and there's a very long tail of, of very small things, but there is, um, so if anyone remembers back in the day, Flash, the technology flash I, I made websites in flash and it was um uh 
you know, big in his time, in his time but we, we, I don't think we're able in our, in our web archive to reproduce Flash websites, which is a shame because some of them were, were historic. Um, I know it's, uh, so, some other web archives are able to emulate them, um, which is fantastic, but some stuff does get lost. Thank you very much. Uli, you like to come on. Uh, some, somebody in the chat, uh, Philippa, made the point earlier about uh, the amount of um, medieval documents that are still with us, which have kind of with where the medium has kind of withstood the test of time. And even with the oldest digital records, it's maybe 50 years or something like that, that we have maybe slightly older, but <laughs> um, so, so it's like a constant race to kind of keep up with technology and kind of migrate or emulate, as Jane said, uh, um, shift it into the, the next most likely durable format, basically. Um, probably every decade or every half decade or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Alex, yeah. I just want to come in on one of your points about paper files, where, I mean, it's notable that when paper files get released under the 20 year rule or whatever it was, um, what people absolutely love is the prime minister's scribbles on submissions um, and you know, I, I mean, of course, quite often now that won't happen. There'll be emails to and fro. And I think that reinforces a point I made that actually, I mean, I would favour preserving as much of ministers and private offices and perhaps senior officials' emails uh, as possible so that actually in future people can, um, when the search tools are, are no doubt developed, can actually find that sort of information conveyed by email. I mean, you know, I mean, you have to be very careful because one of the things that I remember from my private office days is that, you know, the minister would scribble on a submission. This is the most ridiculous submission I've ever seen. And it would be minuted out by the private office saying the minister uh, senior submission doesn't quite agree with all the points you made. Um, and so you, you lose in that case, the actual scribble. So I think preserving, you know, the emails that uh, that um, would record the minister's immediate reactions, for example, is actually significant for um, getting aspects of the public record that actually people value. I mean, they, they, you, your you, your comments raise a broader point to think about the, the way in which digital is maybe. Um, uh, breaking down the distinction between the the public uh, and the personal or the, the the kind of professional and the personal um, whereas you know again the, those those paper files would have the prime minister's annotations now you would maybe get the prime minister's views from a, a whatsapp message or an, an email um, but those that whatsapp account and that email account might also include a lot of personal material that, that ministers and policymakers wouldn't want to be made available. And therefore they, th those, those records aren't preserved in the, in the public domain in the way that an annotation on paper would be. Um, is, that, is that sort of, does that uh, seem to, to reflect the situation as you're aware of it, Sir Alex? Well, I, I think we're in, um, I mean, I don't really know what the process for, um, what, I mean, what in, in for paper files was weeding where, um, mm. you know, actual um, documents were removed from the file because mm. they weren't particularly yeah. relevant or possibly because they were too sensitive. And then there yeah. was a, you see in the files, a, mm. you know, a page yeah. set withheld. Um, and I mean, I think one of the issues is development of tools that make that easier for um, for, for dealing with email archives. And mm -hmm. I mean, others have touched on that um, earlier. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we've, we've nearly got, got to two o'clock and we've worked our panelists very hard in, indeed. It's been a fantastic discussion. So thank you so much, um, Sir Alex, Jane, Jason, Tom, Uli, um, for, for a wonderful discussion and thank you all uh, in the audience for your, for your very informed questions.